start with our final talk uh, of today, and then we'll get some drinks afterwards. Um, I've been promised some cool pictures, but this is really about the evolution of an art style of Secrets of Raytacon by Clarence Scott. You guys ready? I want more than that. Ah, that's, that's better. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Clemens, and I'm the artist of a small uh, Viennese independent studio called Broken Rules. And uh, they started out as a student team of three people, and they made um, this game. It was called And Yet It Moves. And um, in the last three years, we spent working on, a, on our own engine and developing two more games. One was called Chasing Aurora, which is a local multiplayer game that came out for the Wii U. Um, and it's loosely based on children's games like Freeze Tag and Hide and Seek, but with flying birds. Um, and the other game is this. Is that sound? Yeah. So, sound? Hmm. Uh, I don't think you can hear the sound. I'm sorry about that. Hmm. Can we have some sound on this? Hmm? Yeah, it is. It's just playing here on my laptop. It's. It's over anyway, okay, so um, this is Secrets of Raticon. Um, it is an open atmospheric exploration game that's uh, set in the romantic wilderness of the Alps. And you play as this guy right here, um, your bird flying through this world and exploring the secrets. And um, you're sort of, you're like a, a half human, half bird, nobody really knows, but it also doesn't really matter. Um, but we chose the Alps as a setting because it is, it is close to our home country, Austria. Um, the Raticon is an actual place. It is a valley that is between Austria, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. And we all love the outdoors, and it, is, it, was, it was close to us, and so we, we decided to choose this as a setting for our game. Um, and when we started out, um, our game, we had a few prototypes and they, most of them looked somewhat like this. So it was just like lines and blocks. And um, that was our starting point and we had to figure out what kind of art style we're going to make for this game. And so we, we started um, looking at pictures um, from, from the landscapes. Um, pictures that, that inspired us and, and were influences for the art style. And for the landscape, it was pretty easy to find things. Um, we really wanted to have something, something rough and mystical. And this last picture right here is probably one of the main inspirations for the game, as you are this bird flying through this rough and jagged landscape. Um, Oh, hang on, I skipped, skipped a little bit. Um, so, yeah, and for, for the culture, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to add uh, various animal cultures to the game, and um, we wanted to have a really tribal feeling for, for those, those cultures that we were creating. So these, these bird people that you play as, they should have some, some um, tribal feeling to them. So. Uh, we were, it, it, it was easy, when you look at different countries and, and, and their cultures, there's, it's easy to find really um, impressive stuff 
that, that gave us, when we found those pictures, it was immediately for us that they had a kind of vibe that we, that we wanted to put in the game. Um, so, uh, especially um, the figures of the, of the Haitian carnival were really inspiring to us because each of those figures have a unique background story um, that is pretty much unrelated to each other, but it all works in the same, in the same uh, setting, in the same sort of universe. Um, so when looking at Austria, you find this when looking at the surface of the, of the culture of Austria. And you find things like these guys right here. And you also find this guy a lot. Um, but this is all, we, we didn't want any of that stuff really. We wanted to leave out the cliches of Austrian culture. We wanted, we wanted this sort of feeling in, in the characters of our game. Um, and so when, when looking a little bit uh, deeper at Austrian culture, you will find that there are a lot of um, pagan traditions, um, like the so-called Perchtenrand. And uh, the Perchten are these demons, and they're um, uh, it, at the winter solstice, they basically are supposed to uh, scare away the darkness. Um, and there are different kind of variations. These are the so-called Schirrperchten. So there are like ugly Perchten, but then there are also the Schirrperchten, which are the, the pretty Perchten. And you can see they're dressed up way nicer, and they have ridiculous huge hats. And, um, and also, like, they have on their hats, they have sort of mirrors that are supposed to reflect the, the evil and the demons. Um, so, yeah, there are different kind of variations of this culture, and this is not necessarily anything with Perchten, but it's a cow with a cool hat, so I figured I have to put that in there. But um, at one time, I stumbled across these guys, and there are also, in another part of, of Austria and Switzerland, there are also Perchten, and um, they were really close to, to where we wanted, to, what, what kind of feeling it should have, because there are like, they're sort of demons and mystical figures, but they're not really, they're not really scary, but they're, they're weird in a way and, and interesting. And that was, that was a big inspiration for us. And also like this last guy right here, he's definitely already more, more like a, a, a mystical creature than, than a human being. So um, with these things in mind, I started sketching for the game and I started started drawing and um, I just basically tried to get a feel for the landscapes that we're gonna have in the game and um, and the different landmarks that we could have that we put in there and uh, we decided pretty early on that we didn't want to have man-made structures in the game we basically wanted it to be all nature um, because we wanted the game to take place in a sort of parallel time dimension, I guess. Um, so we wanted to we wanted to avoid the impression of that there have been humans living in the past. Um, so um, my my regular background in, in drawing is is also more on the illustration side of things. Very it's kind of character focused. I do like comic illustrations like this. And it's, it's usually, yeah, very focused on, on characters. So uh, painting landscapes and, and doing like an alpine landscape for this game was, was very challenging. And um, so I started out with uh, mock-ups like this. Um, that was one of the first mock-ups I did for the game. And, um, we kind of liked it, but it felt a little bit too generic and, and not unique enough. Um, although I still kind of really like the last guy with the huge nose. You can see where that is coming from. Um, so um, I, I kept on working, and this, this, this kind of here was the first mock-up that we liked because it had this sort of dreamlike atmosphere. 
and um, we decided to, to go with it and um, do it, uh, apply it to one of our prototypes that we had. It was a racing prototype. Um, uh, one versus one player could race with a bird across this landscape. And um, you can see I kind of started incorporating elements from the sketches. Um, but our tech base was still very young at this moment. So basically, all the background artwork I did for the prototype is essentially one huge PSD file that we just loaded into the background of the game. And it had a couple of gigabytes. And it took hours, no, minutes to load, but it seems way too long. So we went to uh, GDC with that prototype and showed it off. And we got pretty good feedback on it. Um, but style-wise, from, from the artwork, it was, still, it was still missing something. It was still there. It seemed it had a little bit too much, too much kitsch. And it, was, it, it didn't stand out enough on its own. So at this point, I kind of Felt, felt lost on what I should, should try next, because there were tons of other sketches that I did in between. So I needed a new perspective on, on how I should create a unique art style for this game. Um, so I basically decided to uh, get back on, on other art projects that I was working on and just get out and get away from the game and do something completely different. And. Um, by that time, I, I found out that I uh, had these really nice wooden um, boards in my wardrobe that one day sort of just collapsed. And I started drawing on these wooden panels, and um, resulting in, in this sketch right here. And um, I actually just started kind of cross-hatching and then creating black areas on this. And and I didn't even put any birds in there. It was when I started out with this, I really just wanted to free my mind and do some, some sort of repetitive artwork and, and, and just get into it. But the further I got, the, the more interesting I thought this was. And um, I also had time to think about what is in this Alpine world. What else is there except mountains and meadows and rocks and waterfalls and it's it's kind of empty if you don't if you, if you can't put any any houses or buildings in there then what's left until i had the idea of course well there are, there are animals so i decided to focus on the animals that would be in this world and they essentially were a strong um, influence on the on the overall art style because i started um, sketching sketching different animals that could live or that actually do live in the Alps. So here is a, is a deer, a stag, and I sketched this bear and this wolf right here. And um, every time I did one of those sketches, I started cutting up those wooden boards in different shapes and started drawing those um, animals onto those wooden boards. And um, I returned with them to the office, showing it to my, to my co-workers, and I was like, hey, look, in the last week I came up with this. What, how do you like it? And they were like, yeah, wow, this is great. Good. Keep it up. This is exactly, this is a good direction. And I basically, for the, for the next two or three weeks, I just, you know, popped in once a week, delivering another one of those pieces. And, and everybody was happy. Um, so after doing nine of those uh, wooden board pieces that ended up being the, the final concept art for the game, um, it was time to go back and transform this whole thing into the digital realm, make it like take this art style and put it into a game. And that was, that was, a, that was a big challenge. Um, this was one of the first mock-ups that I did coming from from, from those concept arts. And you can see there's the, there's the wooden texture in here. I'm not sure how good you can see it. Ah, it's, it's good enough. And it's, it's, it got very, very vector-based and, and, um, um, and, and it, it has got very clear lines. So this was the second mock-up that I did. 
um, as you can see, I also like added the clouds that were in the concept art. So there are many elements that I basically directly took from the concept art and put it into the mock-up. Um, and um, we decided to go with that and um, do the second art, uh, or do the second prototype in this art direction, this art style. So this is what we did. And um, much of it went pretty much exactly the way it was into the game. And um, there are a few things that we didn't do. For example, the cross hatches. And I don't know if you saw it in the previous concept art. So you see all these, all these cross hatches. That was one of the main ideas of the concept art that I wanted to do. I, I thought it was, it was interesting. But when we put it into the game, we uh, realized that it, it doesn't work when you have a moving camera. So as soon as, as you have like uh, cross hatches and, and you move across the camera, they just basically start blurring up. Also, the second thing was that the cross hatches would basically just blend into a new color with the color that was below it. So as soon as you zoomed out, it seemed just like another color in between. But the texture of the cross hatches got completely lost. So we decided to drop that, and um, no, let me find my slide. There we go. Because it made it too, too noisy, and it, it only looked good when, when on static images. So another thing that we added was um, a blur at the edge of the camera, which we later on dropped again, but it was, it was it was just an interesting, interesting thing to try out at first, and we went to GDC with this. Or actually, we went to to uh, to the PAX in Seattle, the Penny Arcade Expo, um, to collect feedback about the game and, and and how people like it. And people seem to really dig the art style and um, enjoy the game as well. So we basically decided to to stick with it, and I started creating more. Um, character artwork for it because we, we needed to get more more animals into the game and and so these were the first sketches for that. Hang on a sec. So as you can see there are all kind of different bird types and variations that I just started playing around with and um, uh, resulting in some, some pretty neat character designs. Um, the lower one in the middle right here basically directly went into the character design of Solitude. Um, each of these characters, they, they received a name and uh, they also received a backstory that is really not present anywhere in the game at all, but it was really kind of important for us to um, to create a backstory for each of them, just to uh, keep everything together. Um, so it's somewhat ambiguous, but for us it was Im important in the process to make. So as I went along working with this art style, I got more and more confident, and uh, we decided to go back to the single player part of the game because all the prototypes we had before were actually multiplayer prototypes. And um, the single player part of the game um, uh, had, a, had a title screen that looked very much like this. And originally it was called um, Chasing Aurora. Um, we, and it was supposed to be a story-driven single-player game with the multiplayer modes that were our prototypes. Um, but the actual game was 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 an explorative single-player game, and the game was about this uh, sun ritual where the uh, the tribe of the bird people uh, would go up to the highest spot on the mountain and they would collect the sun and. Um, drop it to the bottom of the mountain and, and their bravest warrior had to uh, prove worthy and, and retrieve them. So, and that was, the, that was the story of the game. So, as you can see, we, I made a lot of 
I made some, some mock-ups where you, the player, retrieved the, the gem with the sun inside, and the sun would have been the only light source in the game. Um, here you can also see that we kind of dropped the wooden background because we felt it made the game too flat, and so that kind of got lost in the mix. And we also dropped the edge blur again on the screenshots um, because it made made it too much feel like there was a, 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 that you were looking into the world through a, through a camera, and we really wanted to have to, an, an experience for the player that he is inside of this world. So. Um, there were supposed to be uh, three chapters in the game. Um, with each chapter, you would go higher up the mountain as you returned the sun gem. And um, the chapters were called uh, Frost, Cast, and Frost. So you basically you had three three zones. Frost would be like the forest, um, where everything was still very very calm and very mellow. Um, cast would be above the timber line where things would get a little bit tougher and Frost would be like the very top of the mountain and also the hardest part of the game. Um, at the end of each chapter, uh, the shard was to be returned at a specific spot. This is one of the sketches of those spots. So it's kind of a, uh, a place for, for a ritual where uh, different parts of this structure would be on different parallax layers and as soon as you get in they would align and you would drop the gem into the sun. Um, so with all these things in mind we created another, we created a mood teaser and now I would need sound again for my video otherwise this just doesn't properly work. Um, I'm just gonna try it and see if it works. Sound. No, again not. Can we somehow get sound for this video? Hello, sound man. Sorry. Still waiting. Get this video running with sound. You know, if I, if I just hit play, it just plays on here. Sorry about that, folks. Oh, that's it. I thought it would go. Uh, thunder. Yeah, okay. That explains a lot. There you go. Okay. Ah, nice. Okay. So um, when we released this, this MOOC teaser, um, we were approached by a big company. They're called Nintendo. And they asked us if we uh, wanted to release the game as a launch title on the Wii U. And we thought, yes. Ah, too far. 
There we go. Let's do this again. Um, but we realized we couldn't we couldn't possibly finish that whole game until the Wii U was going to launch. Um, and um, so we decided to split the game into two games. And the first part, we, or we thought that we were going to, or this is actually what we did. We took the, the multiplayer prototypes and made that one game. We called it Chasing Aurora. And we decided to take the single player part that was much more work um, um, and, and make that the second part. So we would be able to hit the deadline of the Wii U launch. Um, so we did that, and we released the game on the Wii U. Um, it was not as successful as we hoped it would be, but um, that is another story. Anyway, um, uh, one of the things that we had to do to, um, um, to make it work was um, to take the game that was before a very mystical adventurous exploration game very much based on the atmosphere and and embedded into something that is a multiplayer only sports tournament kind of game and that was of course a pretty hard transition to make um, it ended up looking like this um, and it was a game that was for up to five players and basically there were just like smaller smaller portions of the world and smaller levels and you could just play um, scored based games and we managed to pull it off but of course people were confused they didn't know what they, they saw the trailer and they had expected to be able to explore this this unique world and all they got was like multiplayer games especially in very small confined areas so it was very hard to make that turn marketing wise and and uh, let the people know well this is also this game but just like a different part of it and the, the other thing that you really want we're gonna make that next um, but yeah still here we are and um, Working still, or actually finishing up Secrets of Raticon. It is going to be released in, within the next weeks. So it's very exciting right now. Um, but returning to the single player, um, we of course had to, we realized we, we had to change a couple of things. We, we couldn't stick uh, with the name, or we didn't really want to stick with the name Chasing Aurora anymore because we wanted to kind of clearly separate it from our first game. So um, we, we had to sort of adapt the name to that second part and we didn't want to make Chasing Aurora 2 because it was something different. Um, secondly, we realized that uh, gameplay-wise the story wouldn't work out as we, as we thought it would. And also um, we had to change a couple of gameplay elements, actually a lot of them. And um, for, so one of the things that we put into the game um, was uh, machinery like this. And this introduced also a new style element, which is very interesting because it changed up the color, the color schemes, and, and it uh, changed a little bit of, of, of this, how, the, how the game would be um, designed. And here's the sketch for, for this specific part the machinery. Um, so, yeah, here's, here's another one of those machineries that you will find throughout this world that you're exploring. With two sketches. Um, yeah, we also introduced um, statues like this that you can find. So this was another new element that we added. And in the end, many things turned out looking like this. This is pretty much uh, like a small part of the, of the final look of the game. And um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's pretty different to what the concept art was for it initially. So it is, a there's, there's a lot more, there are actually a lot more triangles than, than initially planned and also we added, it's, it's hard to see on here, but we added a lot of drop shadows to give the game more depth and a lot of these details changed how, how 
um, the game finally looked, which was always the, all these decisions were usually made to to uh, supply to the game's demands because we realized okay in the in the game space certain things work better than as you planned when you did the concept art so we uh, adapted to that so yeah these are it's also I actually gave away one of the takeaways now um, as I just said um, concept art is not necessarily what the final look of the game will be. It was a good starting point, but in the end, if you compare them, you can somewhat see where it's coming from, but it's not like, this is the concept art, and here's the final game, and they pretty much look exactly the same. So there's a, there's a wide space uh, in between that how the game transitions. Um, Secondly, yeah, supply to the game's demands. Um, this is what I said before. It's just important to go with with what you feel like works in in the game. If you realize like a certain element that you that you always wanted to put in the game just doesn't work out, then uh, you basically have to drop it. And that is one of one of the oh, I'm mixing it up. Here's a. <laughs> So, Kill Your Darlings is actually one, and iterate, that is very important. Like, there are certain things that you're sometimes really, really fond of in the game, or when you initially planned it, but then when you do it, you realize it just doesn't work out that way. And sometimes you just have to let go of those things because it will make your game better. Um, and one more thing is, is also, don't do everything yourself. Um, that this is what I ended up doing because I'm the only artist that broke the rules and I basically do everything from the in-game artwork to to the trailers to the website design and um, I would like to encourage you to to collaborate on as much as possible like if you have other talented people in, in your surrounding then, then collaborate with them. Maybe they can do just like small parts of the game. Maybe they can do the logo because if you get up, if you have to have to do so much yourself, then you end up often like not doing it in the quality that you would like to because you, you just don't have the time or you just don't have the capacity to do it all. So yeah, try to collaborate as much as possible. And um, yeah. This is pretty much it. So, thank you very much. It was a short talk, but it was not the last talk, so. Yeah. If you have any more questions, now is the time. Uh, about non-human things in the world, but you introduce statues and machines. How do you, yeah, so how does that work? Hello? Oh yeah, okay. So, well, that is one of the things that we, in, in a way, dropped. Um, we introduced um, machinery, but we decided that we didn't want it to be, um, we didn't want it to seem man-made in a way that uh, it is something that is immediately recognizable, like a house or like uh, an old car or something like that. Uh, but we wanted it to be kind of a little bit like like alien structure, sort of like a, a, a fr as if it was from a lost ancient civilization. Um, this came, one of the main reasons was actually that we needed them for, for gameplay reasons. Secondly, we had to iterate and shift our story so much that um, um, that we that we decided to basically drop the drop the non-man-made stuff um, rule in the game. But still, we, we yeah again we, we just tried to keep it as not human-made.
And also I can show you the trailer now from the beginning that had no sound if you if you're up for that. Hang on. Let's see. Yep. There we go. Uh-huh. So there you go, Secrets of Raticon. Thank you. Thank you.